All right, how's this mic doing? Okay. It's a big room. And uh, as, as before I get started, congratulations to the French on a great new president. That's pretty awesome. And how about a big round of applause for the great organizers and volunteers of WordCamp Europe? It, it, really, it really takes a lot of effort behind the scenes to put something like this together. So, um, as I said, uh, as, as my introduction said, I've been a 14-year entrepreneur. I've made a lot of mistakes, some of them almost fatal, but I've managed to survive this far. So we're going to go through five of those what I call life lessons or, or the school of hard knocks. Are you guys familiar with that expression here? Apparently, I have a master's degree from the School of Hard Knocks. I had to learn every lesson the, the hardest way possible. So, learning is a gift, even when it's uh, even when pain is the teacher. And then we'll finish up with two items that I think anybody should do. Everybody should do. And if you do those, I guarantee you'll have a little bit of success. So, my my first hard lesson that I learned as an entrepreneur was about burning the candle at both ends. Do any of you guys have a... Uh... Mic check. Damn. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. How you doing? All right, so how many of you guys have side projects? How many of you guys and gals have side projects on your side projects? Some of you might be in the agency space, some of you might be plug-in authors, some of you might be theme designers, some of you might work for a, a, a company totally out, outside, unrelated to WordPress. But in the evenings, you're probably working on whatever your passion project is. And, and since so many people raise their hand, there's probably a lot of future billionaires in this room. Is, as they all start to take off. Well, the hardest lesson I learned here was when we were in a design agency for about six years, and then for about the last nine years, we've been doing Pagely. For those first six years, the pain work always came first, right? You had payroll to hit, you had uh, client projects, you had to get out the door. And as much as we wanted to kind of do something else, do, do more of a, a service model, or I'm sorry, a software as a service model, or a recurring revenue model, it always took a back seat. And you never got around to it. So it didn't, we were stuck. Have you, any of you felt stuck sometimes in your business? We were stuck working the client side, even though what we thought you know, what we wanted to go in that direction, we could never get to it. And so burning the candle at both ends is that expression where you're lighting a fire here and you're racing to try to kind of serve this master and serve this master. And we all know how that ends up. You end up serving none or you serve them both poorly. It wasn't until about 2010, a little bit after Pagely had already launched, that Sally and I made the decision to stop contract work. So Pagey was a brand. We had launched managed WordPress hosting, yet I was still doing some contract work on the side to kind of float the bills. And Pagey just kind of sat there. It went out to the market and just kind of sat there. And it wasn't until we made that conscious decision, no more client work, no more contract work. We need to go all in and focus over here. It wasn't easy at first. But we managed to do it, and now nine years later, all you people think I might have something worth to say. So uh, there's a little tip there, extreme focus. Cut some of the side projects, cut some of the fat, make the decision to go and do one thing very well and be the best at it. And I think that's a, a valuable lesson that anybody with some advice shouldn't have to repeat like I did. As I said, um, for about six years, we were an agency, doing design, SEO, light development work. We started using WordPress at WordPress 1.2b. So uh, we've been using this great CMS for quite a long time. 
Who here in the agency space kind of uh, thinks they need the newest chair or the newest laptop or the newest tool or they need a nice office so that people would take them seriously? Sometimes we surround ourselves with the appearance and the, and the, the facade of being successful when maybe that's not necessary to perform our duties. And I got caught in that trap. Um, I thought we had to have an office and a really nice zip code. I thought we had to have, you know, the latest computers, the fanciest chairs. Well, what happens when the client's check is late? What happens when your client on net 60 decides to be net 90? Or what happens when net 90 turns into nothing? Well, we had um, a couple business lines of credit set up. I'm sure you guys are familiar with what that is, you know. They uh, essentially gave us a big credit card against our earnings and said, have at it. Why they did that to a 26 year old, I have no idea. So I proceeded to spend myself into debt. I had the nice computers, I had the nice this, I thought I was being successful. When the client checks were slow or didn't come on time, we drew on that to hit payroll. You know, at the time that was only maybe 40, 50,000 a month in payroll. But where did that leave us? Always behind, always catching up. So I can see now debt is a wonderful instrument if used properly. Using it to fund the appearance of success, it didn't work out. Ten years later, as of, was it, hun, three or four days ago, we sat down and had a little celebratory moment, and I opened the computer, and I logged in, and I said, hey, we're going to make the last payment on this line of credit that we've carried 10 years almost. So my advice here is uh, don't. <laughs> I, I hope that's uh, pretty apparent. Spend within your means on what you really need, the must-haves, not the nice-to-haves. I think this is probably the hardest lesson I had to learn in business. It's important to attract the right people and the right talent but it's more important to get the wrong people out. Sounds kind of harsh. In America, we're mostly a right to work set up, so you can, it's at will employment, we can fire people, they can quit. And I understand uh, in Europe, there's a little bit more protections for employees. But in the, how this applies is, how many of, no, I won't have you raise your hands, you might rat somebody out. But I'm sure some of you work with others on your team that maybe don't pull their weight, or that are maybe drags on company morale, or maybe they're just really pessimistic and always just negative. Think about how that affects how you see your job, how you go about your day to day. Now look at it from an owner's perspective. If I got 15, 20 employees, and one of them is just the sourpuss all the time, even though maybe they're really performing. Maybe they're a high performer, but they're an a-hole. That happens. You get people that you just like, oh, I couldn't imagine not having this person, but gosh, he's so terrible to deal with. That's just dead weight. We had an employee, nice enough guy. We hired him, he was a little green as a support agent. And after two, four, six weeks, um, it was kind of clear he wasn't progressing on his uh, skills, but more importantly, we had to care more about his job than he did. As owners, it was like our, our responsibility to make sure he was doing his work. That's a recipe for disaster. His team lead was coming like, come on, we gotta get rid of this guy. And I'm like, no, no, you know, give him one more chance, give him one more chance. Finally, we let him go, and what do you know it? all the metrics that we track and support started improving. We had another employee who we felt like we really had to have. He was kind of a key employee. But frankly, I didn't like him. I didn't trust him. 
I would keep him out at arm's distance. I, he was never part of the fold that it was Pagely. And sure, he did well, and you know, we, we grew several million dollars in revenue while he was with us, uh, and a lot of it was him driving that. But I didn't like the company. I didn't like what I was doing. This is seven, eight years into Pagely, well, six, six years into Pagely, 10, 12 years into my entrepreneur career, and I wanted to quit. I didn't like what I was doing anymore because this one individual was just like sucking the soul, the life out of what we wanted to do. And again, if I felt like that, how do you think the rest of the team felt? More importantly, what was that saying to our customers? If Sally and I, if you get to know us, hopefully, we espouse a certain set of values on how we should run a company, how we should take care of people, how we should treat our customers. Those values are very important to us. If a public-facing employee is not towing that line and is saying, presenting a different message, now it's incongruent with the brand. Now we look like fools. The, the customer's saying, I've heard these great things about Pagey, but why are you such a douche? And it got so bad that uh, a good friend of mine, what, uh, here in this room maybe, if I can't see him, he came up to me last night and he's like, you remember that guy? I mean, this is five years later, and every time I see him, he's like, you remember that guy that was working for you? Whoa. So the, the lesson here is obviously you've got to stop the cancer before it spreads. A bad attitude is not worth any amount of productivity because the culture of your company is so important. It needs to be protected. It needs to be nurtured. And it needs to be viciously defended internally. Because without a good work culture, what are we doing? Right? Nobody wants to just go punch a clock and you know, say yes to the man. You want to be excited where you work. And you want to work with people that get it. So as uh, uh, managers or founders, make sure you, you viciously defend what you've created. This one's great. There was a time uh, four or five years ago, maybe some of you remember, there was a big kerfluffle in the WordPress community between a prominent theme author and our fearless leader over the GPL. And it was a very vocal and very messy uh, time in the community. People were choosing sides, people were saying things. It was, it was, it was the peak of WP drama. And uh, I thought I'd save my two cents. I thought I had something valid to say. Well, put it this way, it didn't make me any friends. It didn't make me any friends to the point where, in hindsight, it probably cost us millions of dollars. Not directly, but indirectly. Because once you get a reputation as that guy, that rabble rouser, puts a target on your back. As Tony told me last night, he's like, man, you just, you're, you're too abrasive. You you're, quit being such a rebel. You just got a target on your back. So this is not a call to be a wet noodle and just lie down. It's OK to swim against the current. It's OK to fight the good fight. It's OK to have conviction and say what's on your mind. But mind your tone, right? Or, or mind the venue in which you say it. I, I shouldn't be up here saying negative things about anybody. Maybe in private would be a better situation to, to air my grievance. So in any community, in any situation, what, what, what have you, it's, it's important to play to the audience. And for a long time, we didn't. We thought we knew better. We thought we were the best. We thought this. We thought that. And all around us, our competitors, perhaps you know some of them, were out smiling and giving away shirts at word camps and just eating our lunch. Because I, you know, I got this whole self-inflicted target on my back. 
And it took me a long time, and hopefully we're past that, but it, it took a long time for that kind of stigma, per se, to wear off. So whatever you do in your business, you know, play nice. Be strong, have conviction, but certainly play nice. Uh, the old proverb is something like, you catch more flies with honey. Um, we got to move along a little faster here. This is a picture of Chris Wallace at Pressnomics. He did a great talk on workaholic, being a workaholic. This is not a badge of honor. It certainly is not. When we were launching Pagely, I was working the 85, 90 hour weeks. I thought that's what you had to do. I have to do this. Who else is going to do it? I work and I work. I start shrinking because my back hurts so bad. I'm not sleeping. My gut's starting to hurt. I think I'm getting ulcers. Problems with my wife because I'm just not available. It's not a badge of honor to work, work, to work that much. I have a strong work ethic, which I'm proud of. But that work ethic does not mean sacrificing everything else. Um, you're no good to anybody if you're not at top form. Parents know this. Anybody with kids? We got two kids of oursel ourselves. And would you agree we're better parents when we've slept and when, we, when we've had a little personal time? Maybe you went to the spa or maybe you got to go for a drive. We're all better parents when, when we're in the right frame of mind. Same thing with work. We all work better when, uh, when we're feeling good. So, yeah, those are the five things that I think I did that sunk us. But surprisingly, we're still here. You know, in 2006, we came up with this idea. In 2009, we launched it. Now it's a billion-dollar channel. Managed WordPress is a billion-dollar channel. When you had GoDaddy, Bluehost, WP Engine, Pantheon, Pagely, VIP, da 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 There's a billion dollars a year here. A little something that Sally and I came up with in Phoenix, Arizona. We also did Pressnomics. That's a lot of fun. Global team, 900% over three years, and uh, our pitch is essentially we help big brands scale WordPress. These are the two, this is the first of the two things that I think you absolutely should do if you want to succeed at business. Obviously, iterate, iterate, and iterate. And I'm not talking about your product. I think iteration on your product, the next killer feature, it's passe. I think the next killer feature is your new marketing message, is your new positioning statement. That's where you should be iterating. It's an arms race. You're never going to have as many features or check as many boxes as the next guy. And even if you did, is that really going to help your business? But what you can do is tweak your messaging, tweak your positioning, identify your market more appropriately. How this worked, oh, this, this first one, I went to art school, and uh, we'd sit down, and the professor would say, okay, we're going to do X. Give me 100 thumbnails. You guys understand what those are? Sit down and draw 100 examples of whatever we're working on. That was just a warm-up before we started weeks and weeks of work. So your first 20 attempts, you're just warming up, and you're going to get advice, and you're going to get data points, and people are going to tell you, you should do it like this, you should do it like that. That's all just noise. What you need to apply is not the advice, but apply the learnings. So what did you learn by going through this process, by iterating? You tested this message, did it work? Did you test this message, did it work? You go to our website right now, we're A-B testing two new headlines. We'll see how they work. Most importantly is to seek the blue ocean. Is everybody not familiar with that concept? Right. Pagely? Crowded market. There's dozens now of hosting companies that do what we do. How are we going to succeed? There's hundreds of plugins that do the same thing. There's thousands of themes that are geared towards real estate agents. The blue ocean is seeking the empty space to innovate, to position, to change, find the next empty space that's uncrowded and position there. For Pagely, we said, Okay, well, if everybody's going to do it 
for 20 bucks. We'll do it at 100 and add some features. Okay, if everybody's gonna do it at 100 bucks, we're gonna do it for 500 and move to Amazon. Okay, well, if everybody's gonna do it at this price point, we're just gonna go right to the top and tackle VIP. We're just gonna expand our enterprise services, and we just kept going, finding room to fit and, and, and grow our business. And it took a lot of tweaks and iteration and zigs and zags for us to get there. So again, don't, don't iterate your product, but iterate your, your value proposition. What is it that you were really good at? What is it that you do better than nobody else? Now go say it differently than everybody else. Present it differently than everybody else. That, that kind of gives you space that you can claim as your own. So the, uh, what do my notes here say? Yeah, today's killer feature is the story. Your story, how you did it, how your brand does it better. And uh, don't be afraid to ask for help along the way. Again, this data, you shouldn't necessarily apply everything you hear, but use the advice, ask for help and use the advice to maybe inform your next set of action and then apply the learnings from that and keep going. This is the final thing that I attribute. All is a perfectly acceptable word here. All our success to. Sure, Sally and I you know, worked hard in the early days. Sure, we caught some breaks. But all of our success is due to our team. You need to invest in the people in your company to such a degree that they could not see themselves doing anything else. And I'm not talking about financially. While that is very important, and we pay our team exceptionally well, way above market, there's other things that go into it. It's about creating a space. It's about creating a culture. It's about defining a mission that people can get behind. It's about standing back and letting other people get out front and flex their wings. Think about if you're an employer, do this exercise. Think about a conversation. Imagine a conversation between your employee and their friends in private. Right? They're at the dinner table talking to a buddy. The buddy's like, how's work? Your employee answers. Imagine that. If you don't like that scene, you got work to do. Because what your employees are saying privately is how they feel. And if it's negative to such a degree, you're not getting the productivity. They're not on mission. Your business is not gonna succeed to the level that it could. As founders, you need to be really careful to mind the greed. You know, I look at the bank account statements coming in, I'm like, holy crap, I can do X, Y, Z. But we have to remember no, just reinvest it, reinvest it, reinvest it in the people, reinvest it in the product, because it's not about us. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with the golden rule, do unto others as you would wish them to do unto you. That's, that's how we try to run everything at Pagely, with our customers, with our brand, with our employees. And this is the final thought, which I think so many companies get wrong. And if you get it right, I guarantee you're going to unlock. It's, it's like a switch. It just goes from red to green. It's a switch. And you'll be surprised at how quickly things start to fall in place. In a typical corporate structure, corporate hierarchy, business organization unit, whatever you want to call it, you have some people at the top. And you might have some people in the middle, and you got people on the bottom. All the decisions are made up top. But the people down at the bottom are responsible for those decisions and held accountable for their results. So what are we saying? As an employee, you get no say in the matter. 
but you get fired if it doesn't work. As an employee in that situation, you're responsible for executing somebody else's vision, and you're fired if it doesn't work out, or you don't get your raise if it doesn't work out. What we've done at Pagely is follow a philosophy, which I didn't even know what it was at first. Uh, one of our recent hires essentially handed me a book and said, whether you know it or not, this is how you run the company. So now I have names for these things that we just kind of did inherently. But how we organize our company is there is people at the top. There's nobody in the middle. So there's people at the top and just everybody else. Those people at the top, their only job is mission planning, defining the mission. What is the mission? What are we trying to accomplish? And that's it. I think we need to go into X market. I think for us to prosper as a company, we need to do Y thing. Then it's up to everybody else to figure out the strategy to execute that mission. And then we give the authority, which in the old way, is always at the top. We give the authority to everybody to make decisions, to act, to interpret that mission, to change the strategy on the fly. As long as it's against our corporate values and our mission goals, everybody from the newest hire to the most senior hire has authority to do whatever it needs to be done to, to achieve that uh, mission. So then they're held responsible, or then they have that realm of responsibility and then they're held accountable. So now look at the equation. You have a say in what you're responsible for, that which then you're accountable for. What, is, what this has done is create a culture where there's no excuses, nobody passes the buck, everybody practices what we call extreme ownership. You own everything within arm's length. You own the outcome, you own the, the strategy, you own the results. There's no, well, no excuses being made. If you can somehow design your company structure, your, your employees to that degree, I think you will find that productivity shoots to the roof, the culture is amazing, and there's really like nothing that can stop you. Everything just clicks into place. Instead of two people pushing, you have a team of 40 or 50 or 60 all marching in step towards the same goal. So the key lesson there is obviously invest in your team always. Let go of control and your ego, which was hard for me, to allow others to excel. So that's it. Sorry if I went over. Thank you. Too late for questions or? No, we are perfect in time. You did not run late. Thank you so much. That was so inspiring and interesting and you have great knowledge and experience Thank and you. I'm quite sure there will be a lot of questions here in these rooms for you. So therefore, we have uh, two standing microphones here in front of the room and we have stu two standing microphones uh, on the upper rows. So I would uh, love to encourage you to use these microphones if you have questions uh, to ask to Joshua. And please don't feel shy, and especially not because you're maybe not an English nati native English speaker like me, as you heard. So please, if you have questions, use the microphones. Thank you, Kasper. You're the first one. Go for it. Hey, Joshua. Kasper uh, from WP Media. Thanks. That was a Amazing talk, thank you very much. And uh, the only question I have for you is when you're going to write your book. <laughs> Good one. Casper, was it? Yes, sir. Casper, thank you. Uh, funny you mentioned that. No. Uh, we, Sally and I, uh, if you don't know this, we're co-founders and husband and wife. So for 14 years, we've been entrepreneurs and husband and wife, having two battles. Rather than just trying to figure out how to be married, we're trying to figure out how to run a company together. So we've always teased that we're going to write a book called From the Bedroom to the Boardroom. <laughs> and any other married co-founders out there can submit chapters, right? <laughs> I want to pre-order that book. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's <laughs> I could do a whole other talk 
on working with your spouse. It's, it's so great and Please do that. Yeah. Good one. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question up on top. Please go. Hi. Um, the, I'm Paige. I come from Cancun. And there's a question that I would like to ask you. You were talking about how being a workaholic is not a badge of honor. I would like to know how is it that you reform from that? What is the first step? Right. His question was, how do you reform from workaholicism? You know, what are the 12 steps? I'm, I'm going to have to be honest with you, I kind of cheated. We found a little success, and I could hire people to do more of the work that I was taking on, and then that allowed me to step back. That's not always feasible, obviously, if you're still grinding away. So then I think it takes additional self-discipline. If you're a solopreneur and you're working really hard on something, you just have to have the mental wherewithal to stop, analyze your, your, your process, analyze your results, and say, you know, maybe if I went and slept for a couple days, or maybe if I went and took a vacation for a couple days, or maybe if I stopped and went and reconnected with my kids and my wife, for a couple days. This, this problem, you know, you'll solve it so much faster. How many of, that's common, right? You're working and working and working, you're like, fine, I give up, I'm going to bed. And then the answer comes to you. You just gotta get some downtime and get your brain back in order. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Um, if there's any more questions, I would, love, I would like to, because you were talking about um, in, uh, investing in, into your team and that unfortunately it's necessary sometimes to fire some employees that are not good for, um, for, the, for the whole concept. So uh, what traits are you looking for when you're hiring new members mm. for your team? Okay, so the question is what traits do we look for when we hire the, a, a new team member? Pagely is 100% distributed. It's pretty common now in the WordPress space. So we don't have a physical office. Everybody works remote. Two employees of mine are here that I just met for the first time here. Uh, but they've been working for us for seven months, uh, several months, and I just met them in person now. So if that's the context, if it's a distributed team, then what do we look for? Most definitely self-discipline. The discipline to get the work done without direct supervision, but the discipline to know when to take a break. Because as you mentioned, we don't want people burning out. What we ask for in our hiring process is, I ask of you, potential employee, 125% of your effort for six hours a day. That sounds normal in Europe. In America, that blows people's minds. Because you know, we're, we're known as a workaholic culture, and you got to stay late. But we're like, no, work-life balance. Have the discipline to be on point in the time allotted, and then have the discipline to know when to just check out. Uh, what our senior, what's his title? Director of Hosting Operations. If this guy got hit by a bus, we'd have a bad day. Put it that way. <laughs> we had to take his uh, SSH keys away and kick him out the door and say, go take a vacation. You're no good to us. You know, we had gone through two big launches, and it was just kind of like, here's a gentle reminder to have the discipline to turn it off. Go take a vacation. So primarily, it's all about self-discipline on both sides, to be productive and not overwork yourself. Good. Any more questions? No, I think no. we're done. Oh, here's one. Oh, there is one. I, Good. Sorry. Please. I have, I have two things. Um, the first thing is uh, the guy writing this text. Uh, I was just thinking, like everyone in here must be thinking, what happens if we challenge that? So uh, this is a challenge for the text guy. So <laughs> try, try to follow along here. All right, I'm going to say a bunch of names and then try to write it down. All right. <laughs> Brandy, Heather, Channing, Brianna, Amber, Sabrina, Melanie, Decora, Sherry, Vandy, Kristen, Samantha, Autumn, Ruben, Taylor, Tara, Tammy, Ora, Shills, and Tull. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> All right. Cool. Ah, oh, sorry. I just always been wondering about that. The second question is for you, because you talked about what you did and the kind of things that you regret doing. But we all know that we make some errors that we learn from, and we also make some errors that we don't learn from. So my question to you is, what is the, which is the error 
that you have done in your life that you don't think that you have benefited from, something that you have done that you would rather live without, that is a total waste that you would live without. Just the, you're asking, what's the hard lesson that had nothing valuable come out of it? Okay. Good one. <laughs> God, that's a tough one. While I'm thinking about that, you should have seen the stinky eye she was giving you. She was not happy. Um, I don't know, Sally, you want to help me on this one? What's something I regret? What do I, what, do, what, what gets me? I guess. <laughs> golf. <laughs> yeah, my golf game is so bad. No, that's not <laughs> it. No, I just said, you know, if, if sit down over a beer and let's have a chat, and I, I could probably unload on you. I just, nothing's coming to mind right now. Sorry. Good. So, thank you so much. It was an honor to have you here. Yes. Thank you. Big applause for Josh Ross Travel. That was amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs>